In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's amazing. I mean, that would have been enough. Have you ever stopped to think about that and just been awed that God created everything? There, there's a term we have for it, a uh, Latin term, ex nihilo. It means he created everything out of nothing. He simply spoke and, and it was. I mean, there was, there was we, I can't wrap my mind around it. I can't imagine anyone can figure out how there was absolutely nothing not even any space. I mean, there's, there was just nothing. And then God spoke and then it was. And then, you know, God created the, you know, light and darkness. Even before he created the sun and the moon. I, I don't understand. I just can't understand how it works. But, but God did that. God spoke and, and it was. I mean, I, I can take some clay. And I'm a, I'm a decent uh, sculptor. I can take some clay or some kind of material and I can craft it and make it look kind of like the thing that I'm trying to make it look like. But I can't make the clay. I can't make the wire. You know, I can't make the thing that makes the wire. I just, God had nothing to work with and, and just spoke and it came into existence. You might be able to take some paint and capture a bit of the beauty of a sunset, but you can't make the stuff that makes the paint. I mean, I'm, someone makes paint. I don't know who or how, but you can't make the stuff that goes into making the paint. Like everyone has to start with something in order to create whatever they want to create. You can you can make the canvas out of something, but you can't make the thing that makes the canvas. You don't know, understand what I'm saying? You can't make the sun. You can't make any of these things. There was nothing. And then God made everything. And we find that incredible. I find that incredible. I imagine everyone else does too. But I think we stop too early. We, we stop at God created. You know, God created the light and the dark, the sun and the moon, the stars, the water, the earth, the sky, and everything to fill them. And it's amazing and it's awesome. But we should also consider that God not only made birds, but he made eagles, hawks, falcons, owls, goldfinches, hummingbirds, blue jays, parrots, and more than 9,000 other kinds. We stop at God made and we fail to recognize that God made all sorts. Uh, even, even this morning during... Our, our prayer time, I, I mentioned that we're talking about creation. I said, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to find verses that, in the Bible that talk about God's creativity. And uh, someone, I won't mention his name, but his initials are Richard Amiot, <laughs> kind of, you know, trying to make me uh, realize how silly I was being, said, uh, Genesis 1-1, you know, God created everything. And, and I agree, you're right, that, that, dot, that that's a, a great verse to talk about God's macro creation. But what I want to talk more about this morning is like the micro creation. Not just that he created a bird, but that he created an eagle, that he created all these 9,000 other kinds of it. I think what I'm trying to say is that we, we're odd with God's productivity, but we fail to marvel at his artistry. You know, you, you take this idea that God created on a, on a huge level, but, but we, we don't really focus on the fact that he made everything intricate, that he made everything beautiful, that he, he just, you know, we, we stop with God made, we fail to recognize, recognize that God made it beautiful. All the summer we've been uh, doing a study on, it's called The Holy Wild, based on this book by Mark Buchanan. It's, it's my favorite book. I say that every week, um, but it hasn't changed. So uh, we're exploring the characteristics of God. You know, we're looking at his goodness, his faithfulness, holiness last week we talked about. So many other things, other characteristics of, of who God is. But today we're looking at his creativity. And I thought, you know, it might be enough simply this morning just, just to name as many categories of his creation until our time was up. I mean, I could Google animals and plants and then give out the incredible numbers of variations of them. Dog. Anyone know how many breeds of dog there are? 400, everything from Chihuahua to Great Dane. And I was curious, has anyone ever done a mix? You know, a, a Great Chihuahua or something? I think that would be terrifying. <laughs> snakes, there's 300 species of snake, all the way from garter to boa or anaconda or whatever one would be the biggest one. But there's really only two that matter. Is it venomous or not? That's all I care about. Spider, there are 45,000 types of spider. And that's just terrible. I mean, I, I could sit here and name them off over and over and over again. Not the spiders, just these, all of God's creation. But we'd run out of time before we got anywhere near the end of the list. 
And we could read off all of Genesis 1 and 2, reading the creation story, but I actually want to look at David's words about it. Psalm 19. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. I mean, I, I just love the poetry that David has. You know, Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth, which is great, but, but David kind of talks about the, the beauty of it, you know. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. I mean, that's, that's so much more impressive to me, the writing, than just simply God created the sun. You know, it bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom. Yeah, he created the sun, but he made it beautiful. He made it amazing. It rejoices like a great athlete, eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. And I mean, that passage goes on and actually talks about, um, he kind of shifts gears at that point and talks more about God's word, as if to say that as amazing as, as the sun is, even more incredible is, is the Bible and the word, that, uh, word of God that he gave us. Paul talked a little bit about this in Romans 1, verses 19 to 20. Talking about the, the people of the world, it said they know the truth about God because he had made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. In, in this book, Mark talks about um, this idea that, that God plays hide and seek with us. Um, when I was a kid, I used to love playing hide and seek in the dark. Uh, this, is, this is years after I was, you know, the, a little one where you play hide and seek and you like hide under a blanket and think if I can't see them, you know, they can't see me. We, we took it to the next level and we waited until, you know, it, it got dark. A, a dark night with, you know, no, no moon in the sky. And it was just, it was like the, the only light came from like the ambient light coming from like a, a house across the street or something. And, and the object of the game wasn't necessarily to, to get back to home base, what you did is you, com- you dressed completely in black and you hid pretty much in plain sight, maybe in the shadow somewhere. And the person who was it would, would walk around and, and look for you. And yeah, you wanted to make it home, but m- before you did that, you wanted to scare the life out of them. So you'd wait till they just came nearby and you'd go, hey, you know, real loud. They'd be jumping and then you'd be a, a tearing off for, for home base. By the way, I found that the fastest way to count to 100 is to, to count to 10, 10 times fast. One, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, six, seven, nine, ten. Right? You just do that over and over, and then you're eventually at a hundred, and people call you a cheater, and I don't get it, but <laughs> I counted to a hundred, just not, you know, with the actual numbers. But God kind of plays this hide and seek thing as well. Isaiah forty-five, fifteen, uh, ESV. He says, "Truly, you are a God, a God who hides Himself." And yet, Jeremiah twenty-nine, thirteen says, "If you look for Me wholeheartedly, you will find Me." It's like God, God has sort of hidden himself behind his creation and he's inviting us to come and discover who he is through it. Proverbs 25, verses 2 to 3, uh, Solomon wrote, he says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. No one can comprehend the height of heaven, the depth of the earth, or all that goes on in the king's mind. It's like he's saying that, that, that it's God's glory to sort of hide himself in his creation. I'm not talking about pantheism. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, the tree is God. I'm saying that, that God has hidden some of who he is, the, his characteristic, in the tree. So that when you look at a tree, and there's so many branches on a tree, as we discovered this past weekend, as we try to chip them all. But you look at, you know, how many, how many leaves are on the branch, how many branches are on the tree. I mean, if you were to take a microscope and look at that, that leaf, you would just be amazed at everything that goes into it. And it's like God is saying, you know, the more you look, the more you look, the more you look, the more you're going to find about me, the more you're going to discover about me. And, and he uses his creativity to help us do that. And he says it's, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. It's, it's, that's our job to try and figure out who God is through this. And then verse 3 says, No one can comprehend the, the, the height of heaven, the depth of earth, earth, or all that goes on in the king's mind. And I know he's talking about, you know, the things that the king thinks about here, but as I was reading that with this in mind, I thought to myself, no one can comprehend, you know, all the things that go inside a man's head, the king's head, you know. Like, I am certainly not a biologist, but just to, to try to under, understand how the brain works is just beyond, I think, anyone. I mean, 
I'm sure a scientist could say, well, I understand how the brain works, but you certainly couldn't recreate it. Not perfectly. You know, there's, there's so much in there that, that you just, you, we, we can't really comprehend. We can't use these amazing brains God gave us to wrap our minds fully around how God created us. And sometimes as Christians, I think we try too hard. See, God is creative, and so he gave us this ability, you know, as we walk in his, his steps, to be creative. And as Christians, we, we try too hard, I think, to, we want, we want our stuff to have meaning. So, you know, if we write a, a movie or something like that, it becomes God's not dead. You know, we, we, we want to try and tell the story in a way that makes people say, oh, okay, I understand about God. But I don't think God suffers from the same problem. That's, that's something I got from this book. Mark was saying, God doesn't suffer from that same issue of, of, of feeling like everything you create has to have a meaning. I mean, God just likes making, th- making things. He just, I mean, think about these, these blades of grass. Almost no one is going to look at this blade of grass and look for God in it. It just, Curtis is just going to mow it. That's all that's going to happen to it. And yet, yet God still makes it. I, I thought about, you know, just again, thinking about all the things that God has made. There are 260 species of monkey. Uh, there's probably some, well, I don't know, there might be some that we haven't even discovered yet. It seems like every, every year they say, oh, there's a new species of this, and it has, you know, a slightly longer tail or something. I don't know how they determine, you know, the difference between these things, but it's like they're always discovering new things. There are 3,000 type of mosquito. 3,000! I had no idea how many, I thought there was just, you know, a couple, like a male and a female, and they, one of them bit you. That was it. But there are 3,000 different types. There are 14,000 different types of mushroom. There are 160,000 different types of moth. It just, you know, each one slightly different, just different enough for us to be able to de- declare it a new species. I mean, it is, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of, of kings and, and the rest of us to uncover it, to discover it, to, to, to name it, and to say, this is this kind of moth, this is this kind of moth. Microbes. I don't even know what a microbe is, but there's apparently one billion species, as if anyone could count. Look at the population density of, of Canada. And, and think about where majority of us live. I mean, most of us live, you know, just a few, few hundred kilometers from the border. Think about how big Canada is, and how many trees are in there, and how many different animals are in there. God created all those different things, and almost none of them see the underside of a foot. Almost none of them see, are, are seen by the human eye. God created all these things simply because he loves to make stuff. Think of all the incredible works of art that went unseen by millions until someone first invented the microscope. I mean, just God created these things that no one, no one was going to see for thousands of years. Think of the Jackson Pollock-like galactic works of art that are still unseen because no one's invented a telescope strong enough to see them yet if ever. And yet God created them. Beautiful, just because he loves to create. Think of the artistry that goes into your body. If you took all the blood vessels out of an average human adult and laid them out on one line, that person would probably die. But beyond that, the line would stretch over 160,000 kilometers long. That's almost halfway to the moon. Inside me, I probably have a few more. All of that, inside every one of us. God just loves to make stuff. God also uses his artistry, his creativity, to draw us towards him. I'm going to talk a little bit about a man named Job. Job was a man who, uh, who suffered. You can read the story in the Bible. I won't go into it now, but just, just understand that he suffered and he had questions. And at some point, he questions God. And God responds to him. And, and God uses his artistry his, his creativity as, as, his, um, as his answer. Job 40, verses 15 to 24. It says, take a look at Behemoth. By the way, we don't know exactly what Behemoth is. Some people think he's talking about an elephant. There's things in here that don't really fit with an elephant. Some people think he's talking about a type of dinosaur. We don't know. It's just some large land creature. Take a look at Behemoth, which I made, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly? Its tail is as strong as cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit tightly together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. The mountains offer it their best food where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants, 
hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the, w the willows beside the stream. It's not disturbed by the raging river, not concerned when the swelling Jordan rushes around it. No one can cast, catch it off guard or put a ring on its nose and lead it away. I mean, there are, there's verse after verse after verse of God talking about his creation. It's just sort of giving, giving Job a tour of all the things that he has put together. And it works. I mean, God, God meets Job in his pain and, and he, he talks to Job's friends in their arrogance with a, a tour of his art gallery and Job's convinced. Job 40 verses 4 to 5 says, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I've said too much already. I have nothing more to say. And then again, a couple chapters later, he says, you asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I'd only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. I sit in dust and ashes and I show my repentance. I mean, Job has this idea of who God is. He gets a glimpse of his creativity and he just says, I am nothing compared to you. I have no right to question you because of your artistry. And we could stop there. I mean, the takeaway could simply be that God is creative and we should be in awe of that. And that, that awe should bring us closer to him. Uh, I remember reading a, a book not too long ago that talked about the different ways that people come, come to, to God, you know, different ways of worshiping God. And there are some who are, you know, just like contemplatives. You just get this idea and you just want to think about it and you sit in a quiet room and just think about God. And there are others who say, you know what, I need, I need like the, the Bethel worship experience. I need to just be caught up in the middle of this crowd and have like, the music loud and that's, that's how I'm going to most closely worship God. Um, there, there's another way though, uh, there's a, a number of ways, but one of the ways is through nature. And again, I'm not saying that we worship nature. That, that can be a problem. We can take it too far, but simply just to be in nature and to just sit in silence and listen for a moment. And you hear some cricket over here and you hear the wind through the trees and yes, you hear the cars driving by on the road. That's not exactly what I'm talking about. But just this moment of silence and recognizing that God created all of that simply so that he could explain himself to us. And it's our job to, to search it out and to, to try and figure out what we can find out about God as we go through that. But I want to take it close. I want to, I want to make it personal for us because God made this personal. Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything he made was good, but he finished by making Adam and Eve. Ephesians 2 verses, uh, verse 10 says that we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things he planned for us long ago. You are are God's masterpiece. Out of all the billions and billions of things he created, God looks at you and thinks, this is my favorite. This, this is the best thing I made. God created you for a purpose. I mean, that, that verse ends, he says he created, it's not just you're, you're his masterpiece so you should feel awesome about yourself. I mean, that's part of it, but um, you're God's masterpiece. He created you anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do the good things he planned for you long ago. God created you for a purpose, to be his ambassador. God created the sun and the sky and everything to, to draw people towards him. I mean, that's what we read already this morning. But he created you. And when you became a follower of Christ, he put his spirit in you so that you could do a, a job. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21 says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. God, God has, has recrafted you and made you into a masterpiece. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For, Christ, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. It's like, it's like God made the sun and the moon and the, the, the trees and everything to draw people towards him, but he made something better. He made us and he put 
his spirit inside of us. And our job is simply, as Christians, to go around and tell people more about him. To draw them to him, to say, you've got to find out about this God, this God of wonders who made everything. God is the almighty creator of heaven and earth and everything in it, but you are his masterpiece. And the great artist made you for a purpose, to be his ambassador. And like any good piece of art, our job is to make the artist famous. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up and ask God to help us to do that.